Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Gee Verver, and I welcome you to the symposium, uh, The Challenges of Climate Services, Bridging the Gaps. Uh, in the last days, we had a lot of presentation on climate services, examples, good examples, uh, maybe not so good examples, or difficulties, things like that. And uh, now it is the idea of this symposium is to discuss uh, how we are doing in providing climate services, what can be improved, things like that. Uh, and there were three main questions um, that could be raised. I don't know if we're really going into each question specifically, but, but at least that, this is the idea. Um, we should talk about or discuss the, uh, if the information that we are currently uh, providing uh, is adapted to user needs and do the user, are they useful to the users? That's the first question. And the second one is, uh, do we have some good examples where the provision of climate information has led to actions by the users? And then, of course, we mean actions that they don't regret later on. So good, uh, positive actions. And the, the third one is perhaps the most important one, uh, that is to find out uh, what we can do better uh, or what we are doing wrong at the moment and how we can improve. So I think that the latter one is, or the last one is, is I think, the, the most interesting one. And to, to, to let's say, sharpen our mind, we, uh, we are happy that uh, Hans von Storch, Professor Hans von Storch from the um, Institute of Coastal Research in Germany, uh, will give an introductory lecture on this topic. And I was yesterday, I was at the, the, the public debate, and he's very capable of uh, bringing a debate and, and really opposing a question so that everybody is, uh, starts to think. Um, so I'm looking forward to your talk, uh, Hans. Yeah, good afternoon. I didn't know these three questions, so <laughs> I'm not really addressing that. I'm, let's see. Can I open my presentation? Oh, yeah, it would be helpful. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Just speak in there. Yeah, I will do that. Can we have it at F5 or whatever it is? No, we it is have it. It's oh, it is. Oh, oh, you have the book. Thank you very much. So, I'm supposed to speak into this here. Uh, actually, what I'm speaking about is what have we, and there's a number of names here, uh, there's a number of names, what have we learned about regional climate servicing in the past 10 years since we are doing it? And you will see that the way we have done it, or we understand it, is a bit different from what most people think. And let's see, maybe you find it interesting. So what are the challenges in science stakeholder interactions? And there are, of course, many. And I will now have just two issues out of a larger range. So I'm not making claims that I would know all of them nor that I would have good answers, but it's just my subjective uh, approach to this issue. So one of the problems is shown in this diagram. You see as solid lines in the top, oops, it's, uh, does it say something? No, it doesn't, right? No, it doesn't. So you see a green and a black line on the top, which go up from the 19, uh, early 1990s, and uh, maybe peak uh, in about 2007, 2009. And the lower one is uh, the ratio of people, of scientists, which we had, not only we, but also others had surveyed, if they think there's really a warming going on. So, uh, no, that's the upper diagram, the green one. And this started in 1992 in the first survey by somebody else with something like 60%, and then it went up to more than 90%. So there has been made an enormous progress, if you want to say it this way, in convincing climate scientists that it's really warming. The black curve is 
the number of people who would say uh, we need greenhouse gases to explain it or maybe in a bit shorter way it is because of greenhouse gases and you see it starts at about 50 percent and it ends up between 80 and 90 percent. Uh, this one, in one case the points are very close to each other, that's a famous 97 percent claim which is I would say a bit strange because it is to be expected that there should be a difference between those who are convinced that it's warming and who would agree on the cause. And so it's, it's not really logic, even though uh, Mr. Obama is sharing that view. And so that the, in the last point it's going down again does not mean that it's really going down, but it's just the uncertainty of the issue. Now, this is one thing. So the scientists are more and more convinced that something is going on, and it's because of CO2. Then the lower uh, diagrams, they show the uh, media presence of the issue. And then in the US and in Germany, and some are normalized, and you see that the media attention is really going up also in uh, these uh, magic years of 2007 or so, uh, also in 2009 later when climate gate broke. And we see that people really have read a lot uh, in the newspapers. And now the question is how did people, whoever that is exactly, respond to that, and that's a yellow curve and that's the black dots. So this is a survey to what extent people in the US, that's a yellow curve, would be concerned about the issue, and the black dots is to what extent they are concerned in Hamburg. Obviously it's a very important question how feel, people feel in Hamburg. Yeah, we really think about that. So. Yeah, and you see it's more or less flat, so it does move. People were as concerned in 2009 as they supposedly were in 1990. So we really have not changed things. There are some attention cycles, but this is one of the issues. We have not come through in a sense that it's really a serious issue. Everybody has read about it and everybody would also very likely agree in saying it's serious, but in the end, no, okay. The other issue is how are people informed about climate change? And here we have, again, a lit parochial, a survey among regional administrators among German uh, uh, region, coastal regions along the Baltic Sea. Again, it's not too important maybe for the world, but it's a snapshot demonstrating the issue. So we asked them, how are you informed about climate issues? And then you could say this is through TV and newspapers, or that's the red, circle, or you could do that by uh, being in contact to scientists. And then there was, the, you could answer on a scale from one to seven, that's the other uh, part of the diagram, uh, and uh, not at all, that is uh, one uh, in, the, in that side, and strongly that's the seven on the other side. Yeah, that would help, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Really appreciate that. And so you can see most of these people rely on TV and newspapers, in particular TV. Uh, scientists are hardly never, have hardly ever been seen. So they rely on what is in the media, and you know what is in TV. It's simply bullshit, essentially. Now these are two of the issues we are facing, and which is the environment we are operating in. Now, one of the key elements involved in the challenges is the knowledge market, and I would expect that this term has not been used so far at this conference. And what is that? So we first have to think about what type of knowledge are we speaking about? And climate change is first of all a constructed issue. We are not really feeling it, at least no more than our grandfathers felt it in 1880, because they also thought that climate is changing. Constructed does not mean that it's invented. It's not that it's made up, but that we have derived it from a um, more abstract context, and it may be entirely correct, but the way we arrived at the conclusion that we have this is a construction based on different observations. So in the end, we put all this together, and then we said this is it. One of these constructions is scientific, and that's quite normal, because that means based on something what some people would like to call objective, so an objective analysis of observations and interpretation by theories. Another construction is cultural. Indeed, there are many constructions of that sort. Uh, 
in particular maintained and transformed by the public media. For instance, that the weather is getting worse. Everybody knows that, the weather is getting worse. The moral, morale is getting worse also, by the way. So we know that. We know that storms are getting more violent in our part of the world because they always had become more violent. It has never given a period when they became less violent. The same with the morale, of course. Uh, and then climate science is something what we call post-normal, in a post-normal phase, which is characterized when the interest-led utility of the science is a significant driver and less so normal curiosity. We like to say we do science because we just want to know how this and that is. But indeed, the main driver is to use the results in a political context. That's why we get so much money, not because we are so good in solving riddles. Now, post-normal, the concept introduced by Jerry Rabbits, Silvio Huntovic and others in, in the mid-1980s, and this is a state when we see science, in, in, in which science operates when the facts are uncertain, not because of the scientists are stupid, but because we cannot answer the questions in the end, such as what is the sensitivity of the climate system. We have a wide range of possibilities, and it will take a while until we end at a relatively narrow interval for that. When values are in dispute, and different people in the world have different values, when stakes are high, I mean, if we do now an Energiewende, as in Germany, this really, really costs something. And it may be also profitable in the end. And when decisions are urgent. So we are told that we have to do that now in the near future, otherwise the window of opportunity is closing. And so these are all the ingredients you need for post-normal science, and that's what we have. Now let me demonstrate just two concepts, uh, two, two examples of... Uh, uh, these constructions. Uh, on the left, you have what I would call a uh, cultural construction. Then you see a person with a white coat, obviously a professor. I mean, I should have a white coat now, right? And he, I mean, that's important. It's a scientist who's telling it. And who's telling what? He speaks about torrential rainfall, something I don't know, and uh, droughts. In the middle diagram, you see more things, the future generation, sinking islands, and malaria. And in the bo bottom, you see something interesting, namely only the scientist, who's telling you, me included, what to do. It's a scientist who tells you, you must do that, otherwise you get this, 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 more extremes, sinking islands, Our future generations can no live, live any longer, and the health system will be disaster. I mean, I can't read what is there in Japanese, but I expect that it is it. On the other hand, we have the scientific construction, namely that man-made chi climate change is real, it can be mitigated to some extent, but not completely avoided. And then we see here, for uh, the, um, uh, the Danish kingdom here, the temperature development, and you see it's really nicely warming up, and for uh, those who live there, it's not that bad. But if we look at an indicator for storm activity in that part of the world, we see it's more or less flat. So we really cannot see. We have no reason to ask, is climate change doing something with storms at this time? It may, may happen in the, future, in the future, but so far it does not. So there's a more, uh, we need more details in when we speak about climate change. Now the knowledge market. Uh, so the science policy public interaction is not an issue of the linear model which says knowledge speaks to power. And I would expect that half of you find this concept correct. Almost all physicists think that this is the way it should be because they think they are smarter than the rest of the world. Because they're physicists. I'm a mathematician, I don't think that. But however, the problem is not that the public is stupid or uneducated. And indeed, when we have the nice German saying, everybody is almost everywhere uh, a foreigner, we can also say everybody is almost everywhere a lay person. So is it so then if we know much more about climate, are we silent when we speak about, say, economy, about health? Nah, we are joining in as everybody else, even though we could be stupid. But what we have failed as scientists, 
We have not responded to legitimate public questions. In the stand, we have requested, trust us, we are scientists. We are smarter than you. Trust us. And indeed, therefore, climate science is taking place under post-normal conditions. And the problem is that the scientific knowledge is confronted on the explanation market with other forms of knowledge. Scientific knowledge is not necessarily winning this competition. Think of the broad religious movement in the United States. Religion is a wonderful system of knowledge because knowledge has nothing to do with truth or so. It's just the question, how good is it in allowing me to make sense of the world around me? And if I do that in a way that is inadequate but effective, fine with me. Also, the non-sustainable claims making by climate change advocates to the public has led to fatigue. After we have been told all kinds of stuff which didn't happen, people are no longer that excited. And the overselling, this overselling goes with the loss of our capital, the capital of science, which is the trust of the public. And so we should not be surprised if people don't listen anymore to us and if we see that even though we are more and more concerned that something serious is going on, that the public response is saying, no, you're open. Those who believe it, believe it, and those who don't, don't believe it. And the tool we have developed for us in our institute is regional climate services. And I'm drawing now only on examples from our eight years of running this North Ocean Climate Bureau, which does not mean that we think we do it particularly good, but it's just an example. I'm sure there are others who do it uh, even better. Now, what is the purpose of this institution? It's, it's a, to enable communication between science and stakeholders. And one could certainly have a whole half evening speak about who these are, these stakeholders. And that is to make sure that the science understands the question and concerns of the variety of a variety of stakeholders. That's one of your questions, questions which you raised. But making sure that the stakeholders understand the scientific assessments and the limits. That's also important, both sides. And we should provide stakeholders with relevant knowledge, information, and data. And for me, knowledge and information is not the same. About regional climate change, its perspectives, and probable causes. But in doing so, we have to recognize, I suggest, A, the fact that we are operating in a post-normal situation. Everything is political. Second, that there are alternative knowledge claims. People who claim they know better, and maybe sometimes they do. And that other drivers are also present, uh, which are changing the environmental conditions. I think we have suggested that regional climate service, and I'm always saying regional climate service because I think one could have also speak about global climate service, which may be something different. So we first of all need to build a dialogue with public and deciders. And dialogue does not mean preaching to. We have to deal with issues such as, what is the present change? So we have to ask ourselves, are the scenarios we suggest as possible developments in the future, are they consistent with what is going on now? And it's interesting to see that our community has a certain tendency to really enjoy speaking about the future without ever mentioning the present. Then we have to speak about of the character of our perspectives. We have to explain the difference between projections and predictions. We have to be aware of the reality of culturally constructed knowledges about climate, climate change, and climate impact. That is, know your competitors. We have the problem that we have different used, differently used terminology, and we also have to discriminate between legitimate scientific knowledge and politically motivated knowledge claims, or economically. So if uh, a representative of an insurance company two days ago presented in Hamburg evidence that since uh, in the last 30 years or so we had the highest storm surges ever seen in Hamburg in a conference about climate without mentioning that this is essentially due to deepening the river channel and changing the river, I'll come to that in a minute, that is obviously something we should openly say, nay, that's not a good point. And then, of course, we have to understand the post-normal conditioning. 
We also have to provide robust homogeneous data, and we have also to provide robust knowledge. Now, one thing is then, of course, to find out who is it we are speaking to, who is our uh, social and uh, cultural environment. And uh, since about 2008, a colleague of mine, Beata Ratter, is doing with the help of a commercial uh, surveying company, Forza, uh, a questionnaire in Hamburg of what people are concerned about. Um, there. And interest, first they are asked, what do you think are the key problems of this uh, we are facing here in this city? And uh, I think you can say 10, and uh, you are not surprised to hear that climate never shows up among the first 10. The environment in general also hardly. But if you ask them specifically, are you concerned about climate change? Yes, I'm of course concerned about it, because it would be irresponsible not to be. Uh, then, interestingly, the attention and concern varies with our systematic changes, and that is in this diagram. So just go for the three grayish things here. The dark gray means the people are very serious or seriously concerned, and the light one is they are less or not concerned. So you see in 2008, people were really very much concerned. I mean, together they are almost 100% there, if you who don't say anything. But in 2011, it was reversed, and now we are back to 2000, to this year. But it's not so that even after asking, are you seriously concerned, that 90% would say, yeah, I'm seriously concerned. Even though they know they should say, I'm seriously concerned. Another thing is, for instance, this issue with prediction and projection. So the IPCC has a certain definition on that. A projection is a potential future ev evolution. So it is a possible, plausible, con internally consistent evolution, which can happen or not. On the other hand, a climate prediction is the result of an attempt to produce an estimate of the actual evolution of the climate in the future. I mean, this will happen. I mean, if, if we speak about weather next day, we have predictions and we do not have scenarios. If we speak about a party which will take place in one year's time, then we may have to operate with scenarios to find out if it's raining or not. But now we ask scientists, again, what they consider a f scenario or a, pro uh, um, a projection and a um, prediction. And so this is shown in this diagram here. So the description of a possible outcome represents a correct answer projection, 70%. But 20% of the scientists said prediction. Similarly, when we ask them the description of a most probable outcome represents a prediction correctly here, but 30% say it's a projection. So it's certainly not helpful that we all the time use, so to speak, not the agreed upon terminology. And I've always the impression that there's one part in the world where people love to use, to, to not use the right word, that's in the UK. <laughs> they all this, I mean, the, the, the Hadley Center was called for prediction and things of that sort. And so I'm not sure why they love that. But maybe they don't speak scientific English, but just English. And that would be an explanation. Yeah, this is the only group in the world, who do, and the Americans also, who don't speak scientific English. They, sp they think English is scientific English, which is not the case. Another issue is, to what extent is present development consistent with future, what we describe for the future, due to CO2? And we have here one diagram showing four different seasons. Uh, and let's just go for the June, July, August part here. This is the warming according to CREW or EOPS for the uh, 30 years here, shown and uh, these two bars indicate the uncertainty from the two analyses, and the red bar indicates uh, what uh, paleo, long paleo simulations indicate what the variability would be for temperature in northern Europe. And then you can see that, uh, so first of all, they do not deviate very strongly, and the zero is not part of this uncertainty band. That is, we can would not be able to say this is just a result of a random variation. So there is something to be explained. In other words, if you find a dead body on the ground, you found out this person has not had a heart attack, did not die for natural reasons, there was somebody killing this person. And now you can send out the detectives and ask, what is the most probable person uh, who could have done it? And that is the so-called attribution part. And so we know how a potential murder could look like that is the CO enhanced CO2. Uh, presence, and that is given by the, re the green part here. Now, this is the, the mean of all the scenarios. Uh, these are trends 
derived from 100 years developments. And then we have also here the uncertainty due to different scenarios. And then we find out this gray part is not in the green part, which means CO2, if all, everything done, is done correctly here, CO2 is not the only murderer. There may be another murderer. It doesn't mean that the green part was not part of the murder plot, but there's very likely another murderer. While we do not have another murderer in, in winter and in spring, it, maybe in, in, in fall, very likely we have it in, in the annual, let's see. So that means there are possibly more causes, which is interesting because we want to describe how will things develop. Are the present changes already what we should expect or not? And we see here that the warming actually is stronger in this part of the year than we would expect it from scenarios. Another example here is, this is not, not really Hamburg, and this shows storm surges in Hamburg. Uh, and uh, so from 1750 until 2000, and uh, here we have uh, events when the dikes broke, then of course the water didn't rise anymore, and then the city in Hamburg said, no, 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 this is enough, and they stipulated dikes at the height of uh, 5 meters 70 or so, and then the North Sea withdrew, seeing that it would be useless to attack, until 1962 when we had a disaster with many hundred, several hundred people dead, and then uh, uh, the dike heights were, became higher and higher, and we had an enormous, very many, very high floods. That was uh, what the Munich Re people told us. And so it's, uh, it's, some people said it explicitly a while ago, but now it's only suggested that this would fit very well to climate change. However, if we do this little exercise here, so here we see the storm surge heights uh, in Hamburg on, on the one side and in the mouth of the river, a place called Cuxhaven. And this is for all individual storms, and then you see the difference was something of the order of, say, 30 centimeters or, or so until 1962, I dare to say. And since 1980, it's constant, more or less constant again. I mean, it varies quite a bit. And we had an increase in this period here. What happened in that period? In that period, first, the coastal defense was very much improved, so we have less retention areas. And also globalization kicked in. That is, we had to have bigger, uh, deeper, and deeper shipping channels. And so we got 70 centimeters extra from these human activities, and this accounts for lots of this here. So when things are changing, it's not necessarily so that it's climate. It can be something totally different. And we must tell people, of course, that this is possible. We cannot follow the rhetoric of saying whatever changes to the bad is due to climate change. Now we have also some tools, and this is something what we call a Klima Atlas, where you can see how the scenarios, the, um, which, what is the range of options which are described by the scenarios. We did that for a, a part in Poland, and we do that for northern Germany. And we also have built in now an effort together with the German Weather Service so that you can see to what extent these scenarios are consistent with the present changes. Another tool is that we need to know what is the knowledge about climate change in, for the region we are talking about. And so we try to make a report not about climate but about the knowledge of climate, which has the great advantage that it can change even though the climate is not changing. I mean, we can have a different assessment five years later or ten years later, even though the climate change is still the same, but we have a different understanding. And so we do that for the past 200 years for the present change and possible future changes. And we try to achieve, to find out what is the consensus in the literature. We are not trying to describe the best knowledge. We are trying to find out to what extent do we agree. And indeed, it doesn't matter if that is written in English or in Lithuanian which is not the case with the IPCC. They would never reject a Lithuanian text, but nobody would be able to read it. And so we try to describe the consensus, the present consensus, and the documentation of contested issues. So we are not agreeing on blah, blah, blah. It's not many. We have done that for the Baltic Sea. There's a so-called Buck Report, which came out the first time in 2008. And we are now concluding in the really last month of concluding the second one, and that was run together with HELCOM, the UN Organization for the Management of the Baltic Sea uh, Ecosystem.
We've done that in German for the Greater Hamburg region, and we are concluding also a report with others. I mean, there are many others for the North Sea, and I'm not sure that Markus Quanta is here. He is in charge of that project, so if you want to know more about that. One thing we have, for instance, this with the Buck report, the second, we have decided we are not employing any lead author from the first report. They are all new. I think we are much better than the IPCC. The third tool is a data set, which we call in our part of the world COSTAT, which is describing A, the past. So with a high resolution, whatever that is, last 60 years, a consistent description of recent offshore and coastal conditions in terms of wind, storms, wave surges, currents, and also uh, material uh, transport in Northern Europe, plus scenarios of possible consistent futures of this. I tried to extend that, but the trick is to describe both the recent change of the past 60 years plus the possible future one. And who is using that? These are, first of all, governmental uh, agencies, coastal agencies, uh, so we would not have very good chances to find anybody interested here in this country, uh, dealing with coastal defense and coastal traffic. And this is really a big demand. We also work with companies who want to assess risks, such as shipbuilding, offshore building, operations and opportunities, that's wind energy, and the general public. And it's interesting to see that we have more questions for the present state and change than for the future. These companies are not so much interested in what happens at the end of the century, they're interested in what happens now and the next 20 or 30 years. And here we have some, uh, some uh, applications such as ship design, navigational safety, offshore wind, interpretation of measurements, oil spill risk and chronic oil pollution, ocean energy and scenarios of storm surges and wave conditions. Maybe I should, I'm, I'm coming to, how much time is? Okay, that, that fits remarkably well. So I should say a little bit uh, what our clients are and how often we have something to do with them. So we have, uh, we are just counting how often are we going out and speaking to interested groups. We started in 2006, there were just 11 of these events, but since then we have something like one per week. And uh, I think this after a while, we have a certain recognition there. And who are these people, all these institutions? So there's a, what we call adjacent scientific fields, then education, schools and others, the public, that's the Landfrauenbund, um, economy, uh, these are yeah, policy and administration management. So we have a broad range uh, and we speak to them. And they're certainly not always uh, satisfied with what we tell them. Now the concluding remarks. So what? You may wake up again. Take home. What I suggest what you take home is climate change is a constructed issue. People hardly experience climate change. That does not mean that they don't mean that they experience it, but they don't do it. There's one construction to which we adhere that is a scientific one which we claim to be objective to the extent possible an objective analysis of observations and interpretation of theories. Of course, we can ask ourselves, have we really been objective when talking about the hiatus? How open were we to discuss what it could mean if there's really, it would continue for another 10 years instead of claiming that it would be some missing observations in the Arctic? The other construction is cultural, in particular maintained and transformed by the public media, and we should know what this construction is when we want to communicate with people who hold this knowledge. It is not so when we speak to stakeholders, clients and whoever, that they have no understanding of the problem. They have an understanding. It is not a white whiteboard we may write something on, but it's fully scribbled. We are not talking to babies of the year, age of two years. So there's a competition in the mind, and also if we get something in these minds, they're immediately transformed to something else, which is more consistent with what they know in any case. So it's good to know what type of cultural constructions are there, to argue better, and to, as we say in German, 
die Kunden abzuholen, wo sie sind. Can't translate that. It was not that important, so it doesn't matter if you don't understand. Climate change operates in a post-normal situation, which goes along with the tendency of politicizing science and, interestingly, scientizing politics, which I think are both not good developments. Cultural science need to support climate science to deal with this challenge. So this is an issue we cannot solve as mathematicians and physicists. We have to accept that we have to speak with these people, cultural scientists and social scientists, even though it may be hard. But we need them. It's not just for fun. And of course we have to accept that the cultural and scientific constructions mix. And the utility of scientific assertions in the political arena compete with the accuracy. It is not so that necessarily the more accurate statement is winning, but possibly that one which gives better leverage for the client in the political arena. If they can make a better point, they will go for that argument which helps them in bringing their agenda through. Everything else would be very surprising. Now, when we speak about climate servicing, so climate science needs to offer something like a service, which could, should first of all include the establishment of a dialogue with public and stakeholders, and now it's important condition, recognizing the social cultural dynamics of the issue. Climate servicing is not a matter of nice web pages. I am claiming that maybe others are claiming something else, which is fine, of course. We must take into account the competing alternative knowledge claims. For many people, it's clear that Greenpeace knows better, for instance. For others, that the coal industry knows better. We should it, adhere to the principle of sustainability. That means we should tell, provide our knowledge in a way that we can expect that our, uh, if you would be as old as I am, that our PhD students in 20 years will still be asked for. If we had made all kinds of wild claims, nobody will listen to these people anymore because we have used their capital. Quite simple. So the norm of sustainable practice applies to us, not only to them. Us. We must build trust by overselling, over avoiding overselling and being explicit in spelling out the contested issues. In our experience, it does not hurt our ability for dialogue if we do so. We are not considered incompetent if we admit that certain things we do not know. Climate service is more in my opinion, than providing data to mostly anonymous clients, but it's a direct interaction which is needed in many cases. We should also be careful with our language, so we should no longer say the science is settled, we should say which science is settled, which issues are settled, but not the science is in general settled and that we are unwilling to discuss any of these details. No cavalier usage of the terms predictions, when we actually need predictions, because predictions and projections, there is a, a, a power element in it. I can look into the future, I know what will happen, and you have no saying what will happen. Indeed, projections are squarely the opposite. It means you have chance to do something about it, and it's a political decision what we do. And if we do this, then you get very likely that. If you do that, we get this. So it's very different from you get this, because then you have no choice. Language is political. And this ends it, and so in case you have not heard enough and read, uh, confronted enough with this type of strange arguments, then a number of papers you could read if you want, just to demonstrate that actually there has been written something about it. Uh, thank you for your attention. The presentation will be on the internet.
This was half an hour. Yeah. Okay. It's about a little bit more. Yeah, but you said five minutes, and then I thought it's seven. Yeah, no, I, no, it's okay. This is wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, Kill it, yeah. yeah and I'd like to invite the, the panel list, uh, the, the p people in the panel to sit behind uh, the stage. Um, and because the idea is that we would have a discussion now, I think that there was a lot of points raised by Hans already. Uh, I had a bit of feeling. The feeling uh, like in Hill Street Blues where you have a, a, a kind of police officer warning for the outside world, be, be careful outside or something, he says. And that's a bit of feeling I got after your, I mean the outside world out of science is very complicated and, and, and uh, difficult, uh, I think. Yeah, I'm a German, so I support the police. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also interesting, I think, and, and uh, useful to think about it. Um, so we have a, 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 a six panel members, and I would like first to ask each member to uh, introduce him or her, herself uh, very shortly, very very briefly, uh, say it two minutes, and in this introduction also state whether you are a service provider or a user or both, and also perhaps add to all the challenges that Hans has raised, add or or perhaps uh, uh, clarify some challenges, uh, some more challenges. Uh, but I would say not more than one each, otherwise we get too many challenges and we got stuck. Uh, maybe Hilpa, if you would start. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm Hilpa Grego from Finnish Meteorological Institute. Uh, I'm the unit head of Climate Service Center and my background is that I'm a meteorologist a weather forecaster, as well as a climate service provider, a uh, climate scientist, and a forestry uh, management uh, uh, scientist. Uh, and uh, my concern is actually about dissemination, how to reach with uh, the proper wording people to understand what we mean with what we do. So that's kind of very close to me in this climate service theme. And uh, this multidisciplinary education and training is something that I would like us to debate on. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Laurent Lubu. I'm working for the research and development branch of EDF, the French power company. Uh, so my background is in physical oceanography. So now I'm, I'm working in uh, applied meteorology and uh, atmospheric environment group. And uh, I've been working there for more than 14 years now. And uh, just to be brief, I would say that I'm quite happy because I've been advocating for uh, collaboration and partnerships between users and providers of weather and climate services. Because for me, it's a, yeah, weather and climate are very close, in fact. And uh, I've seen several talks here in this conference, especially from people from Germany, from the Climate uh, Service Center, from Daniel Jacob and so on, talking about collaboration and co-production. And that, that makes me very happy because I think this is the only way to develop uh, useful products for industries, for the public and so on. So thank you very much for this. Now we have to, uh, to do it in practice, but it's, it's always a, a very good step forward of recognizing this. Good afternoon, my name is <coughs> Rupa Kumar Kolli. I'm from the World Meteorological Organization. Uh, I'm responsible for the Climate Applications and Services Program. Uh, before joining WMO, I have been uh, a climate researcher, basically, uh, dealing with climate prediction and projection, both aspects uh, for the monsoon. So with that, actually, I have a research bent of mine, but trying to help WMO in uh, uh, in, in bridging the gap between the real science and then how people can use the science to benefit from the available knowledge. Uh, as part of this uh, debate or this discussion, uh, one challenge that I can think of is, is, is that 
at any given point of time, we have multiple sources of information. We have actually different people saying different things about the same aspect. Uh, and if a user is confronted with these multiple sources of information, uh, how do we uh, help the user to actually uh, take some action based on this information? So this actually brings into question the, uh, the uh, loss of information by combining so many diverse bits and pieces of information uh, or to choose one of them and how do we choose and what is the guarantee that this chosen information is the right one. So this, this actually uh, percolates from global to local scales. We always have users actually uh, cope, uh, actually grappling with this, this uh, uh, type of situation. Uh, to help with this, as part of WMO programs, we have uh, instituted some mechanisms like uh, global, uh, regional, and national uh, uh, mechanisms that, that can help with this aspect. But at the same time, we have this uh, uh, challenge of uh, uh, gaps in the capacity where we have a uh, lot of uh, varied capacities at different levels between the countries and also between the sectors in actually in assimilating this information. So this actually poses a major challenge and how do we address this as a scientific community and provide uh, a solution that can be sustained uh, to actually provide sustainable climate services. So this is uh, a point that I, I would like us to discuss. My name is uh, Inger hansen Bauer, and I'm uh, working at the Norwegian Meteorological Institute. Um, I have earlier been a, a scientist working with the anal uh, analysis of uh, historical climate and also with uh, climate projections. I'm the head of the um, Norwegian Climate Service Center. Uh, this is a cooperation between the Norwegian Met Institute and um, the Norwegian Water Resources and Energy Directorate and Uni Research uh, at the University of Bergen. Uh, so we are three uh, partners and um, uh, um, our main users is not the general public, uh, but a very important user group um, is um, uh, municipalities and counties and also um, governmental bodies with responsibility for railways, uh, for roads, uh, for um, uh, uh, electricity supply, and that sort of thing. Uh, we have been working with them uh, for a long time, so this is uh, the, the new with the climate services now is the uh, future aspects that the climate, uh, uh, we can say that in our earlier products, we. We, um, uh, we um, um, used historical data to calculate uh, um, dimension values uh, uh, which were used. Um, these uh, customers now need these values also for the future when they are planning infrastructure which is going to stand there for 100 years. They need really small scale uh, information and one challenge for us is how far down in scale uh, should we dare to go uh, with our products. And um, uh, that's a, 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 yeah, it's a very concrete uh, question, but uh, that is the kind of questions we, uh, we meet. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Radim Tolash. I am a head of climate change department of Czech Hydrometeorological Institute here in Prague. I am working with uh, CHMI near 30 years. 30 years is a, is a climate normal period, so I am now a good climatologist, I think so. <laughs> uh, I am responsible for uh, climatological database CLIDATA, which is used in uh, CHMI, and that CLIDATA is used nowadays in more than 30 countries around the world. Uh, I am a focal point for IPCC and I am a geo principal for, for Czech Republic. Uh, I was asked here to present some basic or some important information about the climate services, but just one. It's very hard to choose one. I think that you will be surprised with my 
uh, my subject now because I think that most important is to have a good climatological data for climatological services, for climate services. The National Meteorological Services should manage the meteorological and climatological observation. I mean uh, the measurement with weather station, import data to good climatological database, archive data, archive data, quality control of the data. And after that, we are able to produce some climate services, not before. That is, I think, the main challenge for climate services now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, now, maybe I, I, I just wrote down some of the challenges that you that you uh, expressed, and I picked out one, and it, it also fits a bit to a remark that Hans made. Is, um, most of us are uh, climate providers, I would say, or climate service providers. Uh, not all. And I, I, I mean, EDF uh, might be also a a user of climate services. Why is it, and, and Hans said when he asked people in Hamburg how important is climate in, as a problem for the city, that it's not in the top ten of, of problems. No, no. Did I understand you? Are the most pressing problems, then climate didn't show up. If we ask them, is climate a serious problem? Yes, very important. Yeah. Okay, so that's a bit difficult to interpret, but I mean, it, is there a relationship between this finding of yours and the fact that it is relatively hard to find uh, a user, uh, u users to discuss with us how good the services are and to, to come here in meetings like this. Is there any idea of how we can improve that? Would be a question perhaps also to the audience. Well, if I may say something here. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, how would we invite the different uh, stakeholders to come here? We should actually go and ask and chat about what we're doing and maybe say they can get some benefit if they come here. And maybe if we prepare these events uh, together with them, that would be more. That's just an idea. Yeah, I, I think focused discussion and uh, yeah, face-to-face -face discussion with users is really essential if you want to bring them to conferences like this. And uh, you should target specific events dedicated for them on half a day or one day because they have so many things to do. Oh, we all have many things to do, but uh, they don't want to spend one week in a conference on climate, even if it's very interesting, uh, because yeah, there are many things to do and uh, yeah, it should be targeted, I guess. I, sorry, yeah, I, um, I think, uh, I mean, you talk about users. There are several different groups of users, and I think you have to be more dedicated. You have to go into the kind of problems you want to discuss, and then you, you'll, you'll get the users uh, on stage, I think. So, but, but have a general meeting with climate change and users, I, I think that's a very bad idea. <laughs> Yeah, since we are doing this, uh, since about eight years, and we are doing it with clients from our region mostly who are related to the work we are doing at our place, at our institute. And that may be very different in other configurations, and I'm not saying it must be done that way. Yeah, and so we have needed, we needed something like 10 years or more, we started discussing with them earlier, to build a platform so that we can exchange. And we know them, and they know us. So it is a specific group of people we are working with. It is growing a little. Some go away again. But it is so that we, it's not anonymous. So we are not speaking about users in general, but it's so those users which have something to do with the Port of Hamburg, those which have something to do with the coastal defense in Schleswig-Holstein, and things of that sort. So these are specific people. And I think that's the way we have to place ourselves, that we say we are not talking to an anonymous group of people who would, eventually look into our web pages, but that we, and then possibly we say, we start with 10, and next year 11, I'm not sure, or 20, or whatever, uh, but that we no, no longer speak about users in general, that we know they have properties, and they have misunderstandings, and they have demands, and things of that, and we have misunderstandings about them, by the way. Okay, okay, so maybe that was not a good proposal to 
to. Um, I have a, may, now Daniela. Withdraw. Withdrew. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, is there perhaps, um, we should make it more open, is there any uh, question that is burning that you would like to ask uh, one of the panelists? Maybe. I'm Robert Miro from Meteor Group. I have a question uh, about communication. The weather is uh, presented not by scientists, but by special tra specially trained weather forecasters. Should we slowly move to, to also train specially, special people to communicate climate change and do climate services? Or, or should we still let the scientists do this? Maybe a lost cause. Should we hide the professor in the background and let other people communicate? Okay, I first. <laughs> well, uh, at least uh, I can talk about FMI, what we try to do there. Uh, we really try to train the scientists to be able to uh, tell the correct things with right wordings and with right uh, base uh, to the media so that they will pick up the right things. And it's a lot of training. It's not easy at all because you want to say everything and, and maybe you, your answer is three minutes and it's only ten seconds that's picked and that should be the correct one. Yeah, so I, I, I fully agree that this should be more that we should be doing, educating. I would, if I understood the question correctly, I would say yes and no. The yes part is that part which is, let's say, not really representing a scientific challenge that could be done by practitioners, uh, in, by, by companies. Running scenarios nowadays is usually not a big challenge that could be done by companies of that sort, I would expect. We have something of that sort um, in the insurance world where we have companies who are doing the risk assessment. And they are very successful. I think they make a lot of money, but the insurances do not pay because they like to pay, but because it's useful. So I would expect that we have a large extent, expect, uh, sector in the uh, climate service activity which could be dealt in this way. On the other hand, we also need, and that's the point which, what Daniela Jakob is, is stressing, uh, we need to train these people. And I think that's also what you just said, that we, we, there's also a need to really do some professional training on that. That could also take a commercial development, so why not? I mean, it's fine if people earn money with something if they do it good. But then in the end, there are also some fundamental questions left over, uh, which we need to address. And so we should be honest with ourselves. Where is, which scientific questions are left? Are they relevant? What are they? And how do we think we can solve them? And I would expect that a significant part of this climate service support science uh, would be from social sciences. Well, actually, uh, uh, that's interesting you mentioned social uh, scientists because uh, uh, we have, uh, in addition to these um, uh, users we have had contact with for many years, there are also new uh, user groups now. And actually, to get in touch with them, we have been cooperating with social uh, scientists. And it's very important that we work in the same projects. And, and the social scientists, they, they help us to get in touch to, with people and to get people to, uh, because if, if you ask people about climate, they will say, well, it, it doesn't really matter, a couple of degrees. In Norway, that will be what they say. But uh, the social scientists, they are used to talking people into what, uh, well, what does weather mean to you? What does it mean to your uh, practice? And when they start talking, then you come into the kind of problems um, they might have uh, or might not have in a in changed climate. And we have very good experience with working with social scientists in this kind of projects. Well, I can just confirm this uh, because, for instance, in the uh, UPOYAS project we're running, we've been running for two years now, and Carlo is the coordinator. Uh, there are some social scientists working for the project, and they really brought wonderful uh, things in the project because uh, they organize meetings differently, they, they know how to uh, make people communicate and talk together, and this was really a very good uh, um, 
coming into, into the project. And what I'd like to say too is that we're often talking about educating the public or the, the users with climate science and so on, but uh, we should also think to educating the climate scientists with uh, problems of the users. Uh, because how many of you know, for instance, how an energy system works? Uh, what are the processes? What are the decision processes and so on? 99% yeah. of you know nothing about that, I guess. And so I think the training problem is both sides. Uh, people from the weather and climate science side should train people from the user side, but the user should also train people from the weather and climate community. And I think this is very important. This is a bi-directional uh, problem and not uh, uh, a bottom-up approach or top-down approach. Uh, there's mutual uh, gain in working together on all aspects, including training and communication. Yeah. Okay, I think if you look at the European projects, they are all they all have a part with user interaction in it. And it is a kind of, it, it's required almost by the EU to put that in. But I think that is also intended to, to have this training in these projects. Uh, and so it's, to your opinion, it's a useful thing. And I think that's right. Is there, ah, Daniela. So Laurent, can I ask you something here? I, I would like to, be a bit provocative and say, say um, why should a climate scientist know how an energy system works? Aren't there other groups, other practitioners, engineers in between? Do we really have to bridge the gap in a way that we overjump all the other communities who successfully discuss with you about the, 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 the energy system or whatever, and who might, be, um, who might be those being trained from the climate scientists to take into account, not the, the observed, only observed weather type information or whatever climate information you need, but also the projections and the, the, the change of philosophy when you use projections. So, so I, I really, I, I'm not so sure that what we, are, what we have done, I mean, we, it was good that we did it, but I'm not so sure that it is really needed that, let's say, the global climate modeling community has to overjump everyone and to end up with the, uh, the, the, the stakeholder of a medium-sized company in Lithuania. So I, I really question, uh, do we have to do this? Yeah, so I agree that uh, maybe the, the guy who is developing some new parameterization for his global model is not interested in uh, knowing everything about uh, wind power forecasting and uh, system optimization and so on. What I mean is that uh, at different levels there's a need of communication and training. Uh, and it's not only from the climate science to the users, but also in the, in the other direction. And uh, I, I think this is really important because uh, if you want to develop, let's, say, let's talk about people who would develop climate services. They, they, they want them to be useful. So uh, for that, you need to understand what are the decision processes and to identify what are your um, potential uh, added value in, getting, in giving the user more information, more relevant information for decision processes. And for that, I, I, I'm, I'm convinced you need to understand how all this works and uh, uh, what kind of information is required. And then it's, I think it's easier uh, to explain what you can bring to this user or what you can bring, which is a useful information too. Because for instance, when you want to, uh, uh, let's say, dimension a new production unit, which will run for the next 60 years, uh, you would like to know the envir environmental conditions, for instance. Uh, so that means temperature, means in extremes, wind, uh, relative humidity, and so on. And so if you, if you understand what are the needs, uh, you can say, yeah, for temperature, for instance, like I, I can say to you that uh, the temperature extremes will increase in the future, but I can say nothing about relative humidity. And this is an important information for the user because he will make his calculations with business as usual methods uh, concerning this particular variable. And so understanding what are the, the, the necessary variables, the way they are used and so on is, is I think, important. Yeah. 
in that respect. I don't know if I answer the question, but... Uh, Yeah, so I think I was just too schematic talking about two, uh, two parts in the chain. In fact, there are many, many parts, and uh, I totally agree with you on this, of course. I maybe, maybe I could also say something on that. Um, first, I mean that all climate science should be related to stakeholders. That's not meaningful. And I think hardly anybody has demanded that. Maybe the EU has done so, and they have done lots of pledges which were totally useless. I mean, it's just empty words. Many of the EU proposals are full of empty words of that type, and I would hope that they understand that, that they just do something very stupid there in Brussels. And I mean, it's pretty obvious. You just have to add something, some words such as, I will give a talk somewhere, I will speak to the Landfrauenbund and things of that sort. I think that cannot be it. Science is not only for applications, but we are also interested in that, how things function. Maybe also the interaction with society, that's also a nice dynamical problem. On the other hand, climate servicing can inclu will include uh, certainly technical aspects, such as uh, generating scenarios, making them available, visualizing them, which would satisfy customers who have relatively, um, let's say, standard things. But then comes the additional part. I mean, then comes the uselessness of the word user, because they are all different. And if you think it makes sense that scientists who know about this issue, and I'm not talking about all, some, if they should, communicate, it should help to find out what these users misunderstand, what we as scientists misunderstand about their needs, what the limitations are, then we can generate a significant um, added value. And I think that's what, what you spoke about. We are not sp speaking about that climate scientists should become uh, 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 power engineers, but that they are able to understand that. And not everybody should be able to do that, but some should be able to do that, if, and some uh, power engineers should be able to understand what the climate is, uh, scientists do. So it is a certain segment which needs to be dealt with, not climate science in general. And I really would oppose very strongly this attitude of the EU of saying all science must be useful, it must all service climate science, there's no cl uh, si climate change science, there's no climate science beyond climate change. I think that, that is a disaster, this policy. Well, I was going to take a slightly different position on, on this one, um, because I was uh, somehow fascinated by, by your view that climate science now is driven by user needs. I think we are miles away from that. So I, I don't really see what, what you're saying. And actually, I, I, uh, the question for the panel is, is whether, uh, in a sense, um, is climate services is about engaging, is about, uh, as Hans was saying before, it's about also allowing for th this feedback. So I, I'm quite close to what Laurent was saying, and I think there is a huge need for exposing uh, scientists to the need of the users. And I, I see a number of questions, genuine <coughs> research questions, and potentially research line that can be driven by new research, new uh, user needs. I'm not saying that all climate science needs to serve users immediately. But I, I do see that component, and I don't, don't yet see that being the main driver of the uh, European Commission, so maybe I disagree with some of you. But I'm, so the question to the panel is whether you see uh, as an important component of climate service this sort of feedback mechanism to promoting new research questions starting from user needs. <coughs> Well, yes, I, and I think even um, even uh, getting together uh, 
people working in practice with, uh, uh, um, with climate services or who have been doing that for many years, uh, when they are meeting uh, the model people who have been working uh, with their models for many years. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, exciting stuff uh, comes up and uh, new solutions and new ideas of how to develop new products that can really be used uh, uh, in practice. And, uh, 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 and this, is, this is even between um, people who have been working in, in different parts of the meteorology. And uh, uh, also when... Um, uh, um, but, 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 and, and you need actually to bring people together and make them uh, understand each other's uh, language. And I think in, 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 in just uh, such meetings, the new ideas comes up. You said that <coughs> we need the feedbacks. I think it's, uh, you, are, you are right. But it's standard in the activity of National Meteorological Service. For example, we in Czech Republic produce special climate service for uh, road, road uh, traffic management. And after that, and during the winter, we discuss with the, with the user about it to be better and to change the, the service. It's uh, standard. I think that it's nothing new for us. I mean National Meteorological Service. Uh, there is another aspect that we need to consider. We normally refer to user as, a, as one single word, but the user is very complex and, and their, their scale of operations and, and the type of information they need is, is very complex and you have a wide range uh, from which we need to figure out what are the common issues that we can actually uh, uh, highlight and then put some research questions into them. And the most important part is that all this information is in the, in the uh, public domain. And it's, it's very difficult for a user to pick up uh, information that is uh, relevant in terms of space and time. In fact, I have seen in, in many occasions uh, people trying to make sense out of uh, countrywide and seasonal mean forecast and trying to take a decision at a farm level. So these are, these are some of the issues that we need to uh, consider when we are actually trying to get feedback from the user, what type of feedback that we are expecting from the user. And we also should have some kind of uh, uh, a topology of the decision-making context uh, at, the, at, at specific in, in sectors and also at the scale of operations. And from that probably we can, we can actually get some idea on what exactly the users need and, and try to uh, guide research programs into that. Yes, I would like to add this. Uh, uh, what we discussed yesterday was actually interesting of, about the gender aspects and age classes because there are also the public uh, that we should serve actually with the climate services and how, how uh, you could do some new services for children, for teenagers, for adults, young adults, older ones. There are uh, many ways of trying to uh, figure out uh, new services that could be done and, and uh, targeted to different users. And, uh, and we cannot forget about these radio and television channels, al although the technology is advancing and we need to, to understand what, the, what these enterprises are facing with the new technologies. So a uh, wide range of uh, discussion and understanding about the changes that are taking place in, in other things than just climate should be also addressed. Okay, so would that be that the, the answer to the third question, what is required to better meet the needs of the user is to engage, to summarize it, you have to engage uh, for, uh, in a sustainable way with the users and interact with the users a lot. That's what I hear in many presentations in this conference. So that, seem, that is, of course, the way to to uh, go, but are there other, require, are there other um, ways to improve climate services? Uh, this is all about having, knowing what, what the users want, but now perhaps on the other side, how do we provide, uh, are there better ways to provide them with the information? I see three things, I think you were first. 
Hi there, uh, I'm Andrew Harding from the University of Edinburgh. Just a quick question to the whole panel. At the moment, the majority of climate services are provided by fairly established climate professionals in one field or another, who all have other responsibilities and other demands on their time. Would the panel welcome people who are dedicated climate service professionals? And if so, what would you imagine the ideal career path might look like to serve your needs? Could you please repeat your questions? Because, Certainly. Yeah, Sorry. We didn't hear. That was a bit fast. Um, okay. Uh, most of the panel are climatologists or are trained in meteorology in one way or another and serve climate services in addition to other roles that they possess. Is that right? Probably. Um, if there was such a thing as a climate service professional who from the get-go, from early on in their career, was trained to fulfill that kind of need, would that be something you would welcome? Yes. <laughs> how, would you, how would you describe the ideal career path for those people? You should start from the beginning. When you're uh, a baby, you should know when to put on, on a coat and, and, and an umbrella when you go out. And, and, and then have, it, have this information about weather and climate and environment. You should not forget about that. Uh, all the way from uh, the kindergarten up to the university or other, other schools. I mean, that way you could have it with you when you grow up. And the new generations would then be more adapted in all kinds of ways. That's, that's just my idea for your question. Okay, I saw some other questions. Uh, just before, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I think what Hans has been doing uh, in, in Germany is, is somewhat related to what we have been doing in the United States for about 15 years. There are these so-called RESAs, Regional Integrated Science Assessments, and they combine social scientists and physical scientists, and we talk to users. I'll, I'll talk tomorrow about my experience on that. Uh, and there, it's woefully underfunded. It was supposed to become a national climate service, and, well, there's a lot behind that. But uh, is there any thought to developing what we call these border organizations where, where you have people funded from the physical and the social sciences to talk to stakeholders, users, and so forth? Or is this all just individualistic, well, what, what you're doing here? I think there are some good examples, yeah. I'm not sure if, how consistent that is, what we've done and what has been done with you. But nevertheless, um, I think one problem we see in Europe is that Europe is made up of nations. And that is climate service in Germany is considered a task for Germany. That is for Stuttgart and Hamburg, even though we have nothing to do with Stuttgart, but a lot with Amsterdam. So, in a similar way, I guess, the French and, and others, uh, for Estonia, it doesn't matter because it's so small, I guess. But it would be certainly better if um, this issue of maybe also of weather servicing would be organized regionally so that people in the same area, say, of geophysical risks uh, would be sit together and discuss their problems, not because they speak the same language and they all love Goethe as opposed to Flaubert, or something of that sort. So this is not something which should be defined by cultural borders, but by regions. And that would make it much better. But the EU is not able to do that, because it's living from the nations. And so this is a fundamental misconcept. So in my understanding, we would have one European center, climate service center, which would do the most technical stuff, providing good scenarios, providing good access to the data, things of that sort. And then, in all regions of Europe, institutions who would contextualize to the problems people there in the, those regions would consider relevant. And it may be that in the United States this has been done to some extent because it's easier, to, because you had to lump together certain states. And so, in a sense, you, you did that. And I think that's much more efficient. So probably we have this problem that Germans think they should speak for Germany as a whole. 
Well, just to, just to comment on this, sorry. Um, from a user perspective, the regional or even international approach is very relevant because uh, when you are in a particular sector, let's say agriculture or energy, uh, the problems are uh, essentially the same. Uh, whatever the country, uh, of course, there are slight differences. For instance, in France, we are more sensitive to cold temperature in winter, and in Spain, it's uh, rather uh, a warm temperature in summer. But the, the common thing is temperature, and uh, the, the differences are much smaller than the common points. And so uh, we share a lot of things from a user perspective, and so uh, having a broader scope at the national one is very relevant. Let me j just clarify, I think you, this was understood. When I said regional, I did not mean subnational. No, I, I mean uh, continental. Yeah, I mean, it would mean, say, that in the lowlands of Germany, Denmark, Sweden, and, uh, and uh, Poland, and uh, Holland, they have more to say to each other than those people who produce wine. Yeah, that's my point, too. Yeah. I, I don't know if you remember that we have intergovernmental board for climate services. And I think it's a good uh, position to discuss about it there, about some European part of intergovernmental board. It's not necessary to prepare some other organizations now. WMO to do it, did do it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we should go to another question. You have a pending question already for some time. I think that there's some fundamental barriers that came up in Hans's presentation about just basic communication about climate. What is the difference between projection and prediction? Things like that, because we're all talking about it on such a different level that we can't even get past that first stage. So that's number one that I think we need to sort out at an international level and amongst the climate community first. And then secondly, I think we've got a big problem about listening. Um, to the users. If, if anyone's been trained in, in sales, you don't, ask, you don't tell people what you, what you can give them. You ask them, what do you want? Like, what, what keeps you awake at night? And so I think we need to really listen to the end users and react. Okay. Is, there, you, is there some other remark that you want to make or question to the, to the panel? Yeah, this is a, a slightly provocative uh, comment question. Um, it strikes me that a lot of users, I mean, I'm all for actually listening to users and trying to satisfy their needs, but it, it strikes me that as regards the future, there's a lot of users want to know things that we can't actually tell them. And so I'd quite like to know what the panel thinks about how we deal with that. Do we go away, take the money, run the model, give them the prediction and take solace in the fact that maybe will be dead by the time the, uh, the, the prediction sort of is realized or, or not? Or, or is there some other way to, to address that? I think this, this touches a little bit on the point that Inga made in her introduction about what scale we should, we should go down to. And I think it's an important <laughs> philosophical point. Maybe that's not quite the right word, but uh, I think it is an important one. Okay. Hans? So this is actually a problem we have been confronted with because people in coastal defense wanted to know what, I mean, there's certainly, I don't know what the English term is, a certain standard height according to which the height of coastal defense would be uh, set up. Uh, and they ask us then, we want to know what will be this height uh, in 2060 or whatever. And they only wanted to have this number, 63 centimeters or so. And then now you can go home. And so we explain them two things. First, we can't give you that number because we don't know it. Second, in 2070, the number will be different because it will not be stationary, but will develop. So you cannot just continue the practice you've used so far of the assumption that you know the statistics and you know that it's stationary but it's instationary and there's an uncertainty which will go away very slowly. So this is part of the new problem. It took us something like 10 years and they have no difficulties at all to live with this answer now and they're fully adjusted to that. So it needs time to do that and you need of course to speak with these people and to try to find out why they ask that. Uh, and also think about are there possibly different ways to 
deal with their problem, to come up with other constructive ideas. And that's why also scientists are needed for that purpose. Of course, the danger is there that if you don't say it is 63 centimeters, that some company will tell you, of course, if you give me uh, um, um, half a million, I uh, possibly could find out and what this number is. And uh, actually, uh, with a different name, I would also do that. And uh, then I come up with this number and half a million, please. And in, uh, in 1960, 2060, I'm dead. So this is, of course, the problem that we may have companies uh, or individuals who just use it, uh, give an answer, the customers are happy, everybody's happy, but the numbers are useless. Uh, that, that's a special thing, of course. And we all must make sure that this advice we are giving is adequate and also is skillful and not overdoing it. That's at least my advice. Otherwise, we are ruining the entire uh, field. Uh, but of course, in, we, I mean, we have um, uh, responsibilities. For instance, uh, in the Norwegian Climate Service Center, we have the, the Norwegian Water Resources um, and Energy uh, Directorate. And they are, it's their job to tell people how they should, I mean, how far away or high above a river can they build their houses. Uh, that's their job. And uh, um, so, um, uh, let's say uh, that the, today the, or, or the, the, in the, um, what the dweller have given us uh, or, uh, advice is that you should, you should keep to the, um, uh, you, sh you should um, uh, build for the 100 year flood. No, right. But in stationary conditions. Yeah, yeah, right. No, that's right. <laughs> but, but at the same time, uh, they need to relate to some kind of flood map. And um, uh, one way to, to, um, uh, to change uh, the advice is to use another return level calculated as if the climate is constant but use a higher level. That's one way to do it, a practical way to do it. But uh, of course, it may be wrong. The answer may certainly be wrong, but it's their job to give an advice and in some way take into account that the projections give higher rain floods. Thank you. I think it's always difficult to have a bad message in a conversation with someone or, or bring a bad message that you cannot deliver what is what other others want or what the users want and the, the trick is no oh, we okay. have to teach people that the question must be asked different there are answers but maybe the questions must be reframed and it's not us climate scientists who can say how but we can just can say we cannot provide you with the answers you would traditionally expect now let's see if we can develop a different format and that's when also the, the scientists and the stakeholders work together at that time. We cannot do it alone, they cannot do it alone, and just give numbers so that they're all quiet. I mean, sorry. I was, just, I, I, I was just referring to a bad message to make a bridge to the bad message that I have to give that the time is over. <laughs> so it was not too serious. No, it's, it's uh, 6 o'clock, and uh, I think it was a very interesting discussion. And uh, I'm sure it, it's not finished. Uh, but anyway, we have to thank the panel, of course, and especially Hans von Storch for give, giving his presentation. So, and also for yourself.